also joined by um, is by one of my colleagues, um, Dr. Kim Weber. So Kim, do you want to introduce yourself? Sure. Um, I'm Kimberly Weber. I am the chair of the special education department um, in the School of Education. And we, uh, our department helps uh, individuals kind of find their way if they're looking at being in, in part of the helping profession, not just in teaching, but also uh, we have a, a new program, which is a board certified assistant behavior analyst that is just starting this year. So um, we're pretty excited about that as well. So um, welcome to Considering Gonzaga. Thanks, Kim. And like Carrie said, we have one of our, our students with us today, um, Isabel Gilbreth. Isabel, do you want to say a few things about yourself? Yeah, sure. So um, my name is Isabel. I'm an ambassador. So I work with the ambassador program um, and I'm also an English student. So I am majoring in English and then I'm getting my secondary teaching cert. So I want to be a high school English teacher and I'm a junior. So I've been in the program for about three years. Oh. Well, what I will do is just to give you all just a, a brief overview of uh, the undergraduate programs in the School of Education relating um, to teacher certification and education. But then when I'm done though, I think I might have um, Kim Weber talk a, more about special ed if she, if she wants to. Um, but in the School of Education, um, we have various departments. But if you're an undergraduate and you're interested in teaching, um, the department you would work, you would either be with the special education department or the teacher education department. Um, and we have what we call, um, so if you want to be an elementary school teacher, what you would do is you would have a major, say, in arts and sciences, like Isabel's in English, or someone might be a history major. Um, and then you decide, do I want to be an elementary teacher or a, or a secondary teacher, which would be middle school through high school. And then you that's when you come to us and you take all of your teacher certification courses. Um, so the you, you would you would have your primary major, but then you would come to us um, to do your certification courses. And like I said, we have we're um, licensed to provide certification in um, elementary education, which is typical as a generalist um, um, generalist teacher from kindergarten through eighth. Um, and also in secondary and in special education. Um, and then if you're, a sec if you're interested in secondary education, then you choose what we call an endorsement, which is basically the, the content you wanna teach in, in middle or high school. So you might be social studies or you, may, you might be like Isabel and wanna teach English. Um, so what it is is so you get certification and you're kind of, it's kind of an additional layer to your to your major. Um, but also, if you do want to get an, an undergraduate degree in education, we do have a new program called Community Culture and Language, CCL for short. And that's a kind of an interdisciplinary degree where we really look at um, how people learn um, in, in community um, and how different cultures come together to create unique educational um, um, opportunities. And if you're in that program, you can eat, you, you pick two concentrations, one of two concentrations, a community concentration or an elementary concentration. If you choose the elementary concentration, you're able to do some of the certification coursework um, but then you also then have to complete all of the other certification coursework. Um, and then you'd be ready to at, be certified to be a K through eight teacher. Um, if you do the community concentration, it's more broad and it prepares you to work more like in um, kind of nonprofit agencies or community organizations as an educator um, of some sort. So that's a brief overview of our certification but I also want to ask um, Kim Weber if she has more she wants to add, especially about special ed. Yeah. So I know it can be confusing because um, 
like Stephen said, a lot of the individuals, so if you're thinking of secondary teaching, you absolutely are going to be an arts and science major, and most likely in the area that you're planning to do, like history or English or um, mathematics, those kinds of things. When it comes to doing elementary and um, special education or um, physical education endorsements, um, you can have a major in the School of Education. So um, the nice thing is, is those who are doing secondary, um, you, you actually end up with two advisors, one that is for your major area and one that is for your um, certification piece. So you're not left to kind of figure it out all on your own. So there are people to help you. Um, and then if you major in the School of Education in one of the programs, and Stephen mentioned one, um, you, you have one advisor who will then do all of it because they should be familiar with all of the programs. Um, I do like to plug special education and elementary as a combo. Um, there are lots of kids who are going to be in regular education classrooms. And so we do have the combination. So if you're interested in teaching elementary, but also want to be prepared for those students who might later on down the road be qualified for special education services or who may not get qualified because that sometimes happens. We have kids who have special needs but are don't qualify under the regulations that happen for them. So they stay in your classrooms. Um, how to teach all of those students. I then recommend doing a major in special education and adding elementary certification on top of it, which can be done in four years. So just so that you know. That is a possibility. So that's that's one of a, an additional option that's available to you. I think I Thanks, Kim. Yep. Um, what we thought we'd do now, there's um, we'd like to show you a little video about our school, our programs, that gives you a little bit more insight, especially from other faculty and other students. And then after that, um, I just have a couple things to say about why we are unique, but it also comes up in the video. And then we just want to open it up for questions from all of you. Okay, that sound good? So here's the, I'm not a good technology person. So let's see, share screen. Let's see. If it has volume, make sure to hit the audio button down at the bottom too. Okay. Now, why isn't the video? Oops, sorry. Okay, I am really sorry. The video is not showing up. Just one second. Okay, here we go, I think. Okay. Sorry about that. Our student taught 
learning by doing uh, is kind of our credo. You really are thrown into the fire and you have to teach your peers as if they were your students. So our students in the School of Ed learn to be teachers. In addition to that, there are several classes that are connected with service learning. And so this gives them the opportunity to determine whether or not they want to be teachers. I came into Gonzaga a little hesitant, not knowing if I wanted to be a teacher, but all the opportunities they provide you, working in the classroom, being hands-on, and more importantly, the support that they give you is something that really pushed me over to say, yes, this is what I want to do. I want to be a teacher. And as soon as I stepped into a classroom with uh, elementary students at the beginning, I knew that it was exactly what I wanted to do. I was able to kind of see, really, the impact that it can have on students. And at the end of the day, I mean, I really don't believe that any profession is more rewarding than teaching them. Why do you love coming to school? It's because of those teachers. They just were so memorable to me. And they meant something to me because they provided me with care and love and showed me that learning is fun. Gonzaga University is special because it builds a sense of community and a sense of service. It instills that in our students. That's, that's what teaching is. Teaching is service for other people. Gonzaga does a really good job of reinforcing that as the Jesuit mission and uh, helping others for education. My definition of service for others basically is fulfilling the needs of other people before your own needs. And by doing that as a student, you get to understand how to work with kids, how you can accommodate them, and find a way to make them successful. Watching the growth of students in our program is an amazing aspect to teaching. We have a very high placement rate which allows our students to get jobs anywhere in the country and anywhere in the world. Gonzaga University School of Education taught me how to be a professional and they gave me all the experience and the resources and the connections that I needed to find a job after I graduated. People love it here. It's a great community, great support system, and a great family. What makes becoming a teacher so special is just to have my own classroom and to watch my students grow up like my teachers have seen me grow up. I come to Gonzaga to experience it. I think the best way to sum it up is, is, is that it really is a gold mine here. It, it prepares you better than you could ever imagine. One of the um um the, the people in that video, the guy in the gray sweater was actually named, he's one of our alums. And he was named the Washington State Science Educator of the Year last year. So he teaches at a high school here in, in Spokane. So we, so our, our students go on to do great things like Isabel's going to do. So. And one of the things that um, was highlighted in the video that I think makes our program very distinct is that you are put into the, a classroom right away when you start our, your certification program. Um, so some of that classroom experience is, is um, tied to a particular course. Um, and so you have faculty with you um, in the classroom and then they're with you out in schools. Um, and then you, in the, the last semester of your time at Gonzaga, you spend that whole semester doing student teaching at a school um, as well. So that's something that we do a lot of, um, we think it's important to get people into schools right away. So you can start kind of putting into action the theories you learn and the skills you learn um, in the classroom. So, so now, should we open it up to questions? Yeah, that sounds great. Questions and uh, make sure, feel free to ask um, Isabel some questions too as a student, what her experiences have been like. You can type in the chat. You might also be able to um, unmute yourself if you prefer. I have a question. Why do um, um why do you guys want to be teachers? Oh, there is. Oh, here's a question. I think it just takes a little time to get them oh, okay. in, into the chat too. And then we can you can you can grill them on those that question. That's a good okay. one too. So as a Gonzaga student, what was the hardest challenge, Isabel? Um, let's see. So in general, I do think the transition from high school to college is difficult. Um, just because it's not something 
that you're used to. Um, and for me, the hardest challenge was taking complete responsibility for my learning um, because it is put entirely in your hands and Gonzaga does a really incredible job of um, making you feel like empowered for that. But you also need to like develop those skills of, you know, I'm gonna pay attention in class and I'm gonna stay engaged and not for a grade, but for myself. Um, and so that was definitely a challenge, but I hopefully I've gotten the hang of it in my third year. Um, and then another like small, I guess, challenge in the education program was I started my placements during COVID. Um, and so we were trying to figure out how to do all of the Microsoft Teams stuff and all the online learning while all of the schools in Spokane were figuring it out. Um, and so it was definitely a speed bump, but it ended up um, benefiting more than harming, I think. Gained a lot of really um, valuable skills in the technology. Yeah, realm, absolutely. I'm sure. Yeah. yeah. Good. And there's a question about, is it possible to double major and also get your teaching degree? And if so, does it take longer? What makes it more difficult and how would that work with student teaching? Kim, you're muted. Kim, yeah, you're muted. Um, so great question. You can um, double major um, it, if you want to. And depending upon what your majors are, that's where the complication comes in. So um, it's less likely for you to finish in four years if you're double majoring and doing teacher certification. That's a lot to do. Um, there are other way, things for you to consider. And so some students actually will double major and then enter an MIT program and then do their certification there. So, which Gonzaga happens to have one of those. So um, there we go. So that's, so it's hard to say exactly how long it really would depend on what you're doing. And that's what advisors uh, assist you with is being able to say, well, what would this look like? How long would it take? What classes to happen first before you take others? That kind of stuff. So, um, and depending upon what you do, like if you choose elementary and special education, um, you actually do two student teaching. So your entire last year is full of student teaching. And so meeting with an advisor early is really important because we set out the things that you have to do. And so it is a tight process if you really are bound by that four year mark. So, um, but can be done. So that was that, I hope I answered that question. Kim, can can I add something to that too? Because sometimes people are coming in with a lot of college credit. So that can help. Um, if yes. you have AP, IB, college in the high school, running start if you're in Washington. Um, so I'm just gonna put something in the chat that will be a link that will show you what our policies are with some of that credit that people might be bringing in as well. But that that can help too, to shorten the and I Were you done, Carrie? I didn't mean to interrupt you. Okay. The other thing too, Kim mentioned um, and the MIT program, um, and that is a master's in teaching. And like Kim said, some of our students might, especially if you double major, um, you can do your double major um, and then apply to our MIT program to, to do after you graduate. But one of the things that it's helpful with that, if you're a Gonzaga student um, and are interested in doing your most of your certification courses is a master's degree. We have a bridge program and it's called the MIT bridge program and it's for Gonzaga students. Um, and what you do and for and for a variety of reasons may not want to do certification during their undergrad years, maybe because you're double majoring and it, you don't want to take longer. You can take um, some courses teacher certification courses during your undergraduate degree that then um, basically transfer in for your master's degree. And they're courses that you would normally take in the MIT program, but we substitute them because you've already taken them as an undergrad. So you can, um, you, you can um, bring in, if you, and this is only if you're Gonzaga though, but you can bring in up to 10 credits so into the MIT program, it's called Bridge. So that's helpful. Um, 
So from Jules and Liam, um, may I try other courses as well as teaching? Sure. What what do you what specifically are you what courses are you thinking of or and while you might be waiting to type that, I'll mention that I mean every student is taking a solid liberal arts core wow. curriculum. So everyone is taking a variety of different courses. Um, so you can kind of test out a bunch of different areas in addition to the teaching and education specific courses. Oh, good. Yeah. And like care, that's the core curriculum that Carrie's talking about. So that every undergraduate at Gonzaga takes what we call a core curriculum. And another nice thing um, for those of you interested in certification is some of the courses you take, especially like some of the basic courses in our program, like it's called um, Social and Cultural Foundations of Education, that actually counts as a core course as well. So you can get credit both for a certification course and a core curriculum course. Let's see. Um, how about how long would it take for a person to become an English professor? Kind of a different track. That is a different track. That is a different track. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, uh, so I'll start, Father House, you can chime in at any point if you want. Um, becoming an, a, a professor at a university, that's when I hear the word professor, I think of university work, um, is that um, you actually have to have what's called a terminal degree, depending upon what you're doing. Um, that oftentimes is a, 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 a doctorate degree in the area in which you plan on teaching in. And so uh, program. So that means that you would have gotten your bachelor's degree, a master's degree, and then a PhD, which takes a substantial amount of time. <laughs> so <laughs> I, I can't, I can't put a number on it. You know, some people do it the fast way and some people, you know, take a long time to get it done. Because part of getting your PhD is you have to do a dissertation, which is a very, very, it's like writing a book and you do a research project and Good job there, Kim, on that question. There we go. Yeah, my college roommate actually is an English professor. Um, and she, so we went to GU together and she was an English and a history double major. And oh. she's an English professor at a university um, in Colorado. Oh. And um, she, of course, followed that same track that um, Dr. Weber is talking about where she did her master's and then a PhD um, and is now a tenured professor at her school in Colorado. Yeah. Um, I can speak on this last question, if I may. Um, so I totally get it. A lot of times you don't really know what you want to do when you come into college. Um, uh, Gonzaga does a really good job of letting us try different things. So um, if you came in and say you were interested in teaching, they'd put you in a teaching 101 class and you would just get like a feel for it. Um, it would be just like the foundations of teaching, um, theory, that sort of thing. And then a lot of times with those classes, you have to take what's called a, um, a service learning placement. And so you have to do a certain amount of service hours for that class. So my freshman year, first semester, I took education 101 and I had to do a service, like a certain amount of service hours with that class. And for me, I chose a specific program um, that actually put me in a high school or in an elementary school. So I did this program called Science in Action and it counted for credit for my class. And then it was also just like a cool volunteer thing on the side. And it was really cool because it was my first semester of college. And so I was trying to figure that out. But every week I would get to go to an elementary school classroom and we would lead a full one hour science lesson. Uh, one time we brought in worm bins and they played with worms. We did a whole bunch of other like cool science things, but it was really cool because I was only taking that one class, but I was still getting a sense of like teacher theory as well as that hands-on experience. Um, and that's kind of when I cemented that I like wanted to be a teacher, maybe not elementary because it's a little bit tough, but um, that's kind of when I knew. So you could start out by taking that first class and then maybe do some service with that and try to get into a classroom through another program and see how you feel about that. And then at the same time, you could also be taking like a bio 105 class, which I also did. And I am definitely not doing biology now, but 
I tried that. So there is wiggle room within your credits to try like entry levels for a lot of different um, classes and courses and paths. Um, and as long as you kind of like figure that out freshman year and sophomore year and try to get a grasp of what you want to do, you'll totally be fine to try stuff out. Does that answer your question? Cool. And also just to add, Isabel did a great job explaining that. But another thing too is that we have our we we like to we're here to help you kind of figure out too what you really want to do. So all of the faculty in the School of Education. We love talking to you and getting to know you and help you help you decide what do you really want to be doing. And then even like what kind of teacher do you want to be? Do you want to do special ed, elementary or secondary? So we have a, a lot of resources to help. Right. And there's a follow up here with how does the school accommodate for a job? Um, and we actually have a lot of students that work on campus. Um, the last number I heard was like 2300 or so. Huh? Um, I know when I was a student, my job was actually to work at Shaw Middle School. Um, and I was in part kind of trying to test out too to see what ages I wanted to work with. And I ended up working in college admission, which means I work with high school students just in a different way um, than maybe, you know, than someone with a teaching certification. Uh, but it, um, it definitely both helped me, you know, provide me with some funds. Um, I'm not sure if you're thinking of any particular job that like you'd want to transfer your job to here or whatever, but there are a lot of students that do work. You just want to make sure you balance it well with your academics so that you can do well in both areas. Any other thoughts on that? Anyone from our panel here? Would it helpful to talk about like the kinds of like work study or mm -hmm. would that be helpful maybe to help them distinguish between what kind of jobs? Sure, yeah, that's that could be. Um, so we in, um, and you'll hear this in the financial aid session, as far as like how people become eligible for either federal or state work study. Um, those are need based. So they are awarded to you in your financial aid package. And my job when I worked at Shaw was a state work study um, grant uh, to me to be able to work there and then be paid for that. Um, even if you're not qualified for need-based work study, all positions on campus that are institutional, um, they are institutional work positions, those are open to everyone. So really most people, if you're looking for a job, you can find one to help supplement um, your income. And typically people will work 10 to 15 hours a week or so, um, and you make minimum wage, which I just heard as of January 1st, yeah goes up to 1449. No, it's 23, 1423. Okay, then I heard differently, but, um, or um, incorrectly, I guess on, but so it's really close, really close to that though. It's on its way up, I think to 15, but um, currently at like 13 something. And so, um, but you can, you can make that for 10 to 15 hours a week. Um, and it's worked around your class schedule. So, um, we value that your students as well as that you need to have some employment um, to be able to pay for incidentals or whatever you're using the, the funds for while you're in college. Does anyone want to answer? Let's see, how does te the teaching coursework or how does the teaching course work with people with dyslexia? Okay, so um that's a it, it, your question is interesting um in that if you are identified as having a disability um you would then connect with the um the dream office which uh would would help you set up what would be appropriate accommodations based on classes that you were taking and then it becomes your responsibility to for whatever accommodations the university believes that you need based on uh your condition would then say, uh, you contact your professor, you provide them with this information, and then uh, professors then accommodate you. So that, that becomes part of that disability access component. Um, I do think a lot of professors, if you go up to them and say, hey, I have, you know, this disability, um, and, you know, can, can I have an extra set of notes, or is there someone who would, could assist me. A lot of professors are willing to do that. A lot of classes already have like 
the PowerPoints of their presentation online so that you can go back to them, things like that. So a lot of professors are willing to um, work with you regardless of whether you have a designated disability. Um, part of it is, is that you have to advocate for yourself and identify, you know, is this something that, that can happen? Um, but if you qualify through the, the Disability Access Office, um, those then become components of things that you have to do, but it's your responsibility to get it to the professors. Yeah, thanks for your comment, Isabel. I, I agree, they're fan, fabulous to work with and mm -hmm. they work with uh, hundreds and hundreds of students in disability yeah. access so they can help you put together an accommodation plan and contact your faculty for you um, if you don't want to be the one to contact, but that's typically their processes that they would contact your faculty for you to put together a good plan for you. Mm -hmm. Um, and a big thing here is that our professors care a lot about us and they care about our learning um, and part of your experience, especially in the ed program, um, part of your experience is making that connection with your professor and they will be more than happy to help you figure out a plan that's going to work for you. Um, you know, even if I'm having an off week, sometimes my professors will email me and be like, hey, are you OK? And, you know, kind of help me set up an individual plan there. So they really are there for you and they're their help there there to support you. Um, specifically, my ed professors have been some of the most accommodating and um, like kindest professors I've had. Um, they refer to their students, us, as their colleagues, which is kind of cool. And I think that speaks to that connection that you end up building with them. And I kind of this converse, this discussion's um, bringing up one of the things, something that I think is very unique to Gonzaga or distinct just in general at Gonzaga, even outside of the School of Education, is that we really do um, want to get to know students. And you'll hear a phrase when you're here called cura personalis, which means care of the person, which means the faculty and staff at Gonzaga, we, we make it a point to get to know your background, your interests, what's going on in your life, because then that helps us know how to teach you and and what's going to help you to, to develop more. Um, so there's a real care at Gonzaga uh, for students and, and very holistically. So not only your mind, but your heart, your spiritual side. Um, and we all play, a, we all take an interest in that. Because we think that's part of what it means to be educated as well. For sure, beautifully said. Let's see, any other questions that you have? I think we've caught, gotten caught up in the chat. While we're waiting to see if there are more that are going to be popped into the chat, Isabel, can you tell us about maybe some of your favorite um, class experiences that you've had in the School of Education? Yeah, of course. Um, I kind of already talked about my science in action thing, but that was really cool. So. Uh, a very large majority of students at Gonzaga do volunteer work. Um, and if you are in the education program, you will absolutely be doing volunteer work, um, either through those classes or as a requirement for those classes. Um, you have to have a certain amount of hours per semester, but they help you figure out a program you, know, you wanna work with. Um, and I have really enjoyed how well Gonzaga is integrated with the Spokane community. A lot of our programs through the School of Education and with programs in the Spokane area are specifically focusing on um, areas that can benefit from our assistance and from our um, our help, which is really cool. And so it really feels like we are giving back to the community and we're not just like a big school situated in a big city. It really feels like we are here to help people. And in my experience in the School of Education, I've really felt like I have kind of fallen in love with Spokane just through that um, and through that connection that I kind of had, have gotten to build with like the community and the schools and kind of people outside of myself. So I, I really enjoyed that. I feel like I'm selfishly, I feel like I'm doing well in the world and helping out, which is a nice feeling. Um, but it's also definitely something I want to get out of my college experience too. So it's very fulfilling. Um, let's see, I think there was a question. Well, yeah, there's a, there is a question, yeah. Um, if you want to try a different school like School of Health, could you do that? Um, so if you're talking about potentially majoring in nursing, 
that one is direct entry and you have to list it on the application for admission and you have to be admitted into nursing and the only way to do that is coming straight from high school so for that particular one if you were not admitted as a nursing major you didn't apply as a nursing major weren't admitted as a nursing major then no you couldn't go into nursing could you take some classes that could eventually lead to a human physiology degree yes yes you could do that you could take some biology and chemistry um, and some of the other courses that would be required in a human physiology degree um, earlier on so that you could kind of decide if that was the direction that you might want to go. I hope that answered the, the question there. If you were looking more at like health sciences, like if you're not sure maybe if you want to go pre-med instead or some other health science area, um, the, the tracks for some of those start off very similarly as well, and that's really a track of classes along with a major. So you might choose your major, but then start to follow these tracks of classes that prepare you to apply to medical school or dental school um, or something else in the health sciences as well. And that would be open to you too. You can really kind of look around for a little while and take some of these different courses, especially if they're part of the courses that could count for your core, because then you could use them with whatever major you might be interested in eventually declaring. That's a great explanation. Thank you. I might have done it a time or two. <laughs> ah, do you want to cover this, Isabel? What's, what's it usually like the first day of college? <laughs> Oh man, that was a long time ago. It's a little bit scary how how long of a time ago that was. Um, it was it was scary to be completely honest because it's so new. Everything is new. Um, my schedule was new. The people around me are new. My professors are new. Everything is new. Um, but it's also really exciting. The first day of college for me felt like the beginning of something, which was really cool and something I hadn't really felt before. And it really felt like I was like kickstarting my path to figure out what I want to be like in this world, I guess. Um, so it's definitely intimidating, but it's also really helpful to know that everybody, all the whole freshman class is on the exact same page. Um, everybody is trying to make friends. Everybody's trying to find their classes. Everybody is kind of nervous and anxious. So you're really in it together with a lot of people. And then at Gonzaga, we, um, really our freshman welcome program is really comprehensive and really helps you through that first week of school to give you all the support that you need. But yeah, it's no matter where you go, it'll be a little bit nerve wracking, but it's exciting. I think it's one of the most exciting days on campus. Mm -hmm. Actually. I love it too, because many times I get to see some of the students that I have only met over the phone or now like over zoom. Um, when they come to campus and I get to maybe run into them and and just kind of watch them in their their progression and their transition into college and um, it is it's very exciting but I completely understand Isabel's comment too that it is it is scary it's a, it is a transition but you're kind of all doing it together so that is that is a really positive thing and someone makes someone type that it's <laughs> like high school but for big people totally. but I think the difference is you're much more on your own in college yeah so you which is a good thing yeah how is student life on campus and this i think is going to have to be our, our last question and then i'm going to give you kind of some instructions on what we're doing next um yeah so there is actually going to be a student panel i believe at 12 20. so if you have more questions about just like general student life um, at gonzaga that's going to be a good place to ask that but i can do a little i can do a little run over so um our community is really integrated and everybody here is um enjoys being part of the gonzaga community and so a lot of stuff happens on campus we have a lot of different clubs and programs um there is a club for quite literally everything that you could ever want and then if you can't find a club that you want you're welcome to start your own so i know clubs are really big and that's a really good place to meet people and a lot of people participate in that um and then just in general student life you'll always see people sitting outside on the grass and doing their homework or hammocking or getting lunch with their friend. Um, it's a nice balance of work and fun. 
So there's there's a lot that Gonzaga has to offer. And then Spokane um, is pretty cool too. And it's pretty accessible from campus. There's a nice like 20 minute walk along the river to downtown. Um, I did that a lot freshman year, go hang out at the mall or watch a movie or something. So, yeah. Awesome, that's great. And that was a perfect segue because what we're going to do next is take just a 10 minute break. But when you leave this room, you will be directed back to the main room and then you can just kind of take a 10 minute break from there. At 1220, there will be that student panel that Isabel was just talking about. So that'll be perfect. Um, and then after the student panel at one o'clock is the admission and financial aid session. Um, so we'll have that going on. And then there are optional interviews at 145. And we really see those as conversations. If you'd like to talk with an admission counselor one-on-one, -on -one, it's a great way to um, just kind of talk about your interests as well as what your academic history has looked like. Um, if you have any questions or bumps in the road that you'd like to address, especially if you have below a 3.2 GPA, we highly recommend those interviews. Um, but we can give you some advice on if you're, where your test score might be, should you turn it in, should you, um, choose to be test optional or just not and not turn it in and have more focus on your GPA, your curriculum and your writing, which is what we would do if you don't turn in a test score. Um, but we can give you some advice on that scholarships, things like that. So you're welcome to um, stay on after the um, admission and financial aid session for those optional interviews and we'll have some one on one interviews as well. So thanks, Father Hess, for putting your contact information into the chat. I have just a little message for everybody here, too. Um, and um, I can toss in my email address as well. Um, yeah, sorry, sorry, it does sound is scary, the term interview, but truly we see them as conversations. And they're just as much for you to gather information as um, they are for us to get to know you a little bit as well. So any last words from anybody in the panel or shall we let everybody go to their break? Nice right. to meet all of you. Yeah, it's great to great to have you all here. Thanks for your questions. Hi guys, good luck with everything. You're so welcome. Thanks for the thanks in the chat. <laughs> so everybody feel free to go ahead and leave. It'll take you to the main room and then you'll have a 10 minute break. Perfect. Cool. Thank you guys. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you all. Thanks. Bye bye. Bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye.